Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. With me today are the dynamic duo of Daniel Mangana and Alex Standy. This is your Daily Dose of Happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. We three are back again on a Thursday, which is a good thing. It's been a long time since we've been able to do this from the beginning to the end and all that good <laughs> stuff. And, and Daniel is is really, he, he's sacrificing himself so much today because he's actually taking time out from his visit to Sir Richard Branson's private island to talk with us today. I mean, Alex, I don't know about you. I feel special. I feel special. The view, though, for right? those of you just listening in and not watching us on YouTube, the I mean, view. <laughs> holy cow. He's sitting in the great house, as it's called right now, and, and looking out. I mean, it's just beautiful, crystal blue water everywhere that you see. Next time, like, take me with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's disgusting. It is disgusting. <laughs> How rude. <laughs> How rude. <laughs> it's really funny because there are, there are a few Brits that work on the island, and then there's obviously Richard. There's another really cool entrepreneur here called Rudy. There's another one uh, called Gareth. Uh, and there was another one here called Lucy a couple of days ago. And not one of us still live in England. <laughs> <laughs> all of us, all of us, I was just speaking to one of the staff as well. She's British, but she's, she's moving on to work somewhere else. But she's not going back to England. She's going somewhere completely different. It's like, <laughs> it was like, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's like, run away. <laughs> run away. But Rudy's in Florida. Gareth lives in Singapore. Uh, Lucy's Mexico based as well. I'm Mexico. This is Richard's here. It's, it's hilarious. So it's the UK yeah. expats convention going on. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. There, there's a way you can kind of make up to us for the fact that you're in paradise and we're not. Okay. So, so here, here's what let, you let, let, me, let me let me know what I can do. I'll, I'll do my best. I appreciate that so much, and so do our listeners. So here, it, it's a really <laughs> simple task. I know it's one you can handle. What I want you okay. to do is I want you to tell us about something that you've picked up, learned something along the way here in the last year that's relatively new that listeners can use. Whoops, I'm I. Just here. That that listeners can use in their daily lives to do something to improve what they're trying to do. Okay, I'll 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 give one of Sir Richard's tips. So it's one I learned here um, last year when I first came to the island, and it's only work half the day and half the day have fun. So mm. Sir Richard is he's seventy something years old. Um, you know he he's got seven or eight billion dollar companies. And every afternoon, he still has fun. He'll be out kite surfing. We were in the hot tub with him earlier. We had, um, um, so one day of the meals, we have a sushi boat. So the sushi was on a boat in swimming pool and we're in the hot tub. And he's just chilling with us, talking about life and giving us advice when he's running billion dollar businesses. But half the day, he's relaxing. Yeah, that's cool. that's how you do it. I like that, yeah. Now, of course, somebody who's working nine to five, they're going to say, well, how can I do that? Maybe you need to look up what you're doing with your life. Ooh. <laughs> or take from six to whenever for you. For example, you know, um, but if you want to have half the day having fun during the day, then you need to either find yourself getting the skills. Because I'm, you guys know I'm not about job shaming. I don't believe everyone is supposed to be an entrepreneur. I think employment is a very honorable way to go through life. And I think it's sad that some people are made to feel shame that they have a job. Um, mm. That's for me, it's just ridiculous. But if the job that you are in isn't serving you, then you need to go and get the skills, go and get the training. Maybe you need to move to a different jurisdiction or a different country. Uh, maybe you need to go and work in Spain where they have a siesta or a Spanish speaking mm. country where they have a siesta. So it's about resourcing yourself to live life in different terms, whatever that looks like, whether it's learning the skills. Or if you do have the skills for it, entrepreneurship. Although I don't believe everyone should try entrepreneurship, or everyone built for it. Mm -hmm. All right. So that leads to two questions in my mind. The first one is, who should consider entrepreneurship and who should stay away from it? Someone who's ready for the pain of entrepreneurship. Mm. Like the th the thing is, you have got to remember that when you're an entrepreneur, and I, we've been doing me and my mate Josh. When I've been in Dubai, we've been recording a series on my Beyond Success podcast on this. So there's, there's a few clips of it on my Instagram. We've done a few clips from it. But yeah, there's a series of me and Josh McCartney on the Beyond Success podcast. 
if you flick through and see the special with Josh as a special guest, I think most of the most recent um, episodes have been that series. But we've been exploring some of these questions of what it is to be an entrepreneur and what that means. And and the bottom line is, is that it's not an easy road. So I'm here now with um, about three dozen, um, all seven, eight, nine figure entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. Everyone like, has at least got a million dollar business here. And um, it's not easy. You're not always, you know, you've, you've got to juggle this, juggle that. You're responsible. So like when we had... Um, we had some brain, we're doing some, some discussions and I'm not going to go into details because obviously it's confidential what we discussed here, but mm-hmm. you know, sometimes it's like not everybody had a good time during the pandemic and some people are still fighting to get back on top. And they've got people who, whose paychecks are dependent on them solving problems right, and making sure that's taken care of. It's not easy. So Richard's in his seventies and he's still problem solving for in tens of thousands of people to make sure that they've got a job and that they can pay their mortgages. It is a lot of responsibility. Whether it's responsibility to your employees, responsibility to the people that you serve, the stakeholders, to investors, it's a lot of responsibility and not everybody is built to do that. And not everybody really wants to. They just think it's glamorous and most businesses don't make money within the first three or four years. Are you prepared to bootstrap and live on rice and beans for three or four years when your business comes together? Maybe mm-hmm. have it fail and have to you know, buckle your shoes up and do it again. It's not... I mean... There's a couple of people that made a lot of money selling the idea that everyone can be an entrepreneur and made millions and millions of dollars doing that. But people soon found the truth. It's not a glamorous thing. It's it's easier to have a job. Mm. True enough. Yeah, anyone who's ever experienced it knows that uh, it's really rare to just hit it right out of the block. I mean, somewhere right. along the line, you're going to have struggles. Um, exactly. and Alex, you, you and your hubby, you're, you're, you're getting his tattoo business going. How long have you been trying to get that you going know, now? You, know, you, know exactly, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, my God, do I know. It's Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a rough road. But, yeah, I've, I've always taken Daniel's advice as, as far as, like, don't be afraid to fail. You know, don't be afraid to fail and start again. That's the mm-hmm. second part. <laughs> mm-hmm. But, you know, uh, I'm not looking to fail, but if it happens, I'll get right back up and do it again exactly now do you also uh do what daniel was talking about where you take part of your day just to go have some fun for sure for sure i do i have uh i make sure that kenny has a mandatory two days off a week and i take i work like two and a half hour shifts so i can work a a two a double shift and still have the rest of my day okay yeah that's good so you were already doing it or I do like if I have the day off, I'll do like my chores and my cleaning in the morning, and then by the time Kenny gets home, it's relax time. Very good, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I was doing the same thing when I was married, and I'll, I'll actually do it now too. But uh, uh, I, I was making sure that there was always time away from running the business. Mm-hmm. Uh, what used to be Louise's business is actually going to become mine because I'm buying her out, uh, but. That 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 time is important, and it was one of the problems I was actually trying to help solve for her while we were still together because she was working ridiculously long hours to run the business, which is another thing that many entrepreneurs discover. They find they're 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 wearing wearing all these hats, and wearing all those hats costs them you know fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty hours a week, mm-hmm. and, and, that, and you're I mean, not even doing it efficiently anyway. What's that? And you're not even going to be doing it efficiently when you're working in the home. Right. Though. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You got to delegate. I mean, I, well, yeah. more than I'm, that, you, you also have to automate too. I mean, that because that was the biggest problem. She was doing everything manually. So I automated mm-hmm. a whole bunch of it. I took a 60 hour week and shrunk it down to about 10 to 15 hours. So much yep. more manageable that way. Um, and, and yeah, that, that takes some learning to do, to do that. But uh, not only does it take pressure off, it gives you the opportunity to spend time focusing on what you love. Because most people, I mean, let's be honest, Daniel, you you, you run these multi-million dollar businesses, but I'm, I have this feeling that the thing that you don't look forward to the most is sitting down and figuring out how to solve the next business problem. Actually, that's what I love the most. Is it really? Yeah, yeah the problem solving. I kind of do too. But, but, here's, but here's the thing, Walt. It's not just the problem solving. It's, um, it's also like the, the payoff aside from that. So problem solving without payoff like i actually enjoy the things that i do though so it's not just the problem solving with something you don't okay. like it's problem solving around stuff that i like doing 
it's problem right. solving um in a way that's actually a contribution and adding to the world in some way shape or form it's problem solving that has an additional payoff if it was just problem solving for problem solving sake no thank you <laughs> but um but there are other layers to it too okay that makes sense that makes sense because yeah. if you do if you're I guess I was thinking just in terms of the problem solving activity itself all by itself, because, mm -hmm. because that can that's, kind of wear you out, but, yeah, but you're right. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, you know, that's like, who wants that? Right. <laughs> you guys ever try just letting it go till it comes to you? Till the answer comes to you? Well, that's one part. I mean, it depends. I mean, everyone's got their way of solving problems more efficiently. I think for me, definitely the creative process that lead, I'm more of a creative um, problem solver. And so, you know, part of it is making sure that I'm in a space to be creative, making sure that I'm chill. So there's a lot of things I'm juggling right now in terms of problem solving and being in this creative space and having this downtime and having this gorgeous view. Uh, if I just spin around, I'm just, I've just moved to the other side of the house. Oh, come on, it's man. Like, <laughs> it's like, Whatever, dude. <laughs> it's like, I'm problem solving to this view. Okay. There, there wasn't enough um, water on that view, so you had to come over to this view where there's even more. No, the, sun, the sun was there. The sun was there. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> but, um, after this, I'm going to be problem solving. You know, I'll be looking to problem solve with a glass of champagne in my hand. Hot dog. That's going to be what I'm going to be doing next. I don't know what solutions are going to come, but we'll see. And that's you know that's the journey, right? Mm -hmm. you, you've got to set yourself up to be in a position where. Like for some people, they need to be under pressure, right? So relaxing isn't going to work for them. They need to be mm. under pressure. For some people, um, they need to be in a particular post. Some people need to go and have meditation. Some people need to bounce ideas off other people. It's understanding mm -hmm. what your ideal way of problem solving is and then setting yourself up for success. So it's right. partly knowing yourself, really. Oh, I just know yourself. You're going to struggle, I think, if, you're, if you don't know yourself. And, and I think part of it is also learning about yourself because mm -hmm. you, that's one of the things that happens – when you go into business and, and especially as the business starts to succeed, you learn a lot about things about yourself. You didn't really know before. Yeah. 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 Because there's a very organic process to it, I think. And, and I think successful entrepreneurs, that I know uh, the way that they entrepreneur is also tied to a deeper knowing of self. So, you know, it's an amazing entrepreneur. I'm not going to name him, but it's an amazing entrepreneur here. Uh, and he was talking a lot this morning session about being in flow and flow state. And so like he focuses on being in a flow state in order to be able to operate more efficiently. Mm. And, and he doesn't just do it with this. He, that's how he lives his life. He lives his life in this way. And the way that he entrepreneurs is a part of that. And he's had like, I don't know, an eight or nine figure exit. He's got another massive business that he's growing now. Um, he's part owner on another island. There's another island across the water there called Mosquito. He's one of the, the 10 people that own that island. And, you know, he's a very successful person. And people like that, you see, and even like when you see Sir Richard, how he does life, it's like, it was so funny when I got to meet him last year, and I did tell you guys when I got here last year, it's like, mm -hmm. but he is this goofy. I thought that was like, I literally thought it was a fact <laughs> for like <laughs> TV and stuff. It's like, no, he is that, he is that passionate about stuff. He is that goofy and, and fun loving and that childlike. And um, yeah, like the way that I've seen successful people be successful is as a congruence between how they show up in business and how they show up in life. And they make both of them very focused. So in Richard's uh, particular case, what you're really saying is that childlike quality is one of the reasons why he succeeded. I, I would hazard a guess that that's a big component. And that fits well, in. Good. With... Well, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> no, obviously, obviously just, run, just running around childlike with no business acumen isn't going to help. Right, right. <laughs> Where are my millions? I'm saying, no. Where are my millions? <laughs> you know, he's very, he's very focused on problem solving. He's very happy to take risks. He really cares about the people that work for him. He mm -hmm. really cares about world issues and looks to create businesses that solve world issues. He really looks at the customer experience. Yes, but he also is really committed to having fun and that energy. I mean, I've, I've, I've always been a. a, a a fan of Virgin brands and always playing Virgin Atlantic, Virgin trains. I've always used them. And there is a spirit behind them that I think carries through from now having met him uh, a couple of times um, and gotten to hang out with him, you know, here on his home. There's, there's a spirit that translates from him as a person to how his business operate. And I mm -hmm. believe that's contributed to their success. You mentioned business acumen. 
Yeah. Um, I, I'm sure there are always some people. This was a question I asked myself many years ago, and that is, uh, what shelf do you find that on at Walmart? It's <laughs> <laughs> experience. Is that Home Depot, like. bro? <laughs> oh, is that what it is? <laughs> You're in the wrong you store. <laughs> you guys know that I had big success and really awful, horrible failures when I was very young. And one of the things was, mm. not only did I not have business acumen, I didn't have the humility to ask for support from people who have business acumen. Mm. You know. Mm. A successful entrepreneur doesn't necessarily have the acumen, but they have the smarts to know that you need to have people with those acumen around you and mm -hmm. listen to what they have to say and take their advice. So you, you can always hire in brains. You don't need to have all of the skills and uh, an intellect yourself. You can hire it in, but you have to still have it there in the formula, I think. Uh, I wish yeah. that was something I had known, actually, when I was younger, I, I, because I tried to muscle it out myself. And I mean, it's possible that it's way. Possible, but why it's harder. Realize? Much harder. Yeah. It's um, I, it's wild. I think the, the whole, the whole adventure. I think is just so wild. You know, the whole adventure of businessing and creating value. And I think when we understand our role in that adventure, we can play that position much more strongly, rather than trying to force ourselves into another position. Try to force ourselves to be uh, the pitcher, the person on the, the little things on the baseball thing, and then the people trying to bat at the same time. It's like. Be, being the entire team in one person. Like, even Michael Jordan couldn't take it from one end of the, the, the basketball mm -hmm. court to the other and score a dunk. He worked with the team. Yeah. Right? Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if, you, if you're trying to play one on five, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not yeah. the way it works. No, not yeah. really well. Yeah, the, the best the best teams are the, are the ones that actually play like a team. There's no doubt mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. Something else about uh, entrepreneurship, since we're on the entrepreneurship topic for a minute. Uh, we, I asked before, how do you decide whether or not you're somebody who should pr pursue entrepreneurship? And, and like you pointed out, it's not for everybody. How do you know if you're somebody who, I'm going to flip the question around. How do you know if you're somebody who should actually stick with a job career? This is what I would say personally. Unless you feel something screaming inside of you to go out and create value and go through the pain of that creating value, get yourself a job and stick with it. Mm-hmm. It makes sense. That's what I would say. Yeah. You know, if you have if you have the option for someone else to do all the heavy lifting, for you to be able to get that check and pay your bills and, you know, do what you need to do with holidays and stuff for the kids, then do it. If you get the call to do something different, then maybe start to explore it. Do it on the side. Get yourself a little side hustle. Mm -hmm. I think it's Gary Vaynerchuk that says, you know, you can work nine to five in the office and then you've got, you know, even after you've had dinner, you've got two or three hours in the evening. If you're really serious that you can dedicate to building up some side of some kind of side hustle and seeing if that works and taste it and see if it works for you or use the weekend, you know? Right. And if you're worried about family time, find something that you can do as a family together. You and your mm -hmm. partner can do research together. The kids can be involved in whatever, you know, you can do that and see if it's for you. See if it's for you. I think one of the things that we all speak about in the work that we share is be in a conducive space to create. Be in a space where you're going to be mentally, physically, and emotionally able to actually execute on the things. If you're under stress because you quit your job and now you've got to make mortgage payments or rent payments and bill payments and food payments and this and that, and then you've got to be on that hustle every single day, that's not a great place to be in. No. It's really, 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 really no. not. Yeah, definitely true. Um, you also mentioned congruence, and, and then a moment later you mentioned family and mm – -hmm. That, that can also be an issue right there. If, if your family is in incongruence with what you're trying to do, that's going to create mm -hmm. problems. Yeah. And that's actually the last conversation that, um, that Josh and I actually had on the, the most recent one that we put out was, you know, <laughs> your romantic partner is going to be a big impact on how successful you're going to be able to be in business. Mm -hmm. Massive. Like the person that you're spending that intimate time with and that concentrated time with, if they don't have your back, if they don't have your heart, if they don't have your, you know, your size, if they're not supporting you, you're going to struggle. Right. You really, really will. Yeah, because it's not like business doesn't throw enough challenges at you as it is. Right. <laughs> it, you, 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 need, you need a place that you're not on a battlefield. Right. right. There's got to be somewhere in your life that you're not on a battlefield. And if you're on the battlefield of business and then you come back and you're on the battlefield on the home front like that, Recipe no. for disaster. No. And some people might be, able be that to other person's peace. Time. Yeah. What was that, Alex? I said you got to be that other person's peace. Ah. 
Yes, being peace, that's an interesting way of expressing it. Mm. You're at peace when you're providing peace for somebody else. Mm -hmm. That's good. I like that. Is that is that what's working with you and Kenny in terms of uh, getting the, uh, the the parlor open? Getting the parlor open, yes. We 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 all work together, but at the same time, like he's got some ideas that I'm like, mm, I don't think that's gonna work, bro. But at least he's bouncing them off of me, so <laughs> so that works in the sense. But yeah, at the same time, if you're out working all day and then doing your side hustle at night. You know, take that special time between the two of you to like have a discussion over dinner or not have a discussion over dinner. Just relax, watch TV, do something together. But be be that person's peace. Interesting you should mention that about watching television because that was something that I noticed in in my own relationship my, uh, with my ex with Louise. Over time, it it early on it was really good in that in the way you were just describing mm -hmm. and. In the middle years, it was pretty good. Toward the end, everything was about watching television. It's like we were getting further and further and further away from the business, mm -hmm. and, and the business kind the business didn't collapse or anything like that. But the business suffered as a result mm -hmm. because the the the, the balance on, in conversations versus engaging in you know mindless looking at the the boob tube it it created a a chasm. Mm -hmm. if you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's, it's like there was a, a void that's a better word there's a void it was it created a void in conversation of void in understanding so that there, there'd be times where uh especially in the last couple of years i i, I was running the business she was pretty much um, semi-retired at that point uh and the only way she'd ever find out about something was if she thought to ask me you know during the day somewhere because mm -hmm. if i if I brought it up during dinner often, she just wanted to shut it down. Mm -hmm. Like there, there were, there were too many uh, painful memories associated with it. Uh, too, too many stresses that she didn't want to have to deal with. And, and actually that's ultimately what led her to decide to, to sell out to me. She, she was actually going to close the business down rather than mm -hmm. keep wow. a, a viable asset because every time she thought about it, all she could think of stress. was taking a, a, a call from a customer that was going to cause her stress. Mm -hmm. that's what the association had built up to and and that mm -hmm. happens if if you're not giving attention to the, the the nuts and bolts of it yeah well you have to have conversations throughout the day or at least at least gather them all up well gather all your thoughts up and let them loose on the weekend at i don't point, know but yeah something's got to happen something, somebody's got to talk to somebody something's got to give yeah right, right. and mm -hmm. it didn't <laughs> I mean, I can laugh about it now, but uh, yeah. Because whatever That's you're fun. not talking about, you're shoving down deep inside, and eventually it's all going to erupt. So mm -hmm. this is where the Let cooperation uh, between the partners really makes a difference. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's kind of where the rubber meets the road. So, all right. Um, oh, uh, something else I wanted to ask you, Alex, because I, I, I would normally ask this off, off screen, off, off the show, but this, I'll, I'll ask it in this case. How, how is the development of the, the, the tattoo parlor coming? I mean, I, I keep hearing about incremental steps, but where are you guys at? We're slow, but we're working on it. Yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. Lost, we lost the building that we wanted. It went to somebody oh. else, but that's okay because one of the other tattoo parlors on Main Street decided to open up a bigger spot. I'm sorry. My brother-in-law is in the yard with his motorcycle. Anyway, <laughs> so... <laughs> They uh, they opened up a bigger spot two towns over, so they left their spot that's already set up for tattoos Ooh. open on Main Street. Ooh. So we're Ooh. in the getting the loan process, and we're taking it from there. So do you have like a – are you aiming to be open by a particular date or anything like that? I'm not giving it a date because that puts more stress on myself. Okay. I'm just that's fair. let it happen when it happens. Okay. Are you excited? I'm very excited. Oh, okay. Good. I'm very excited because then, uh, then I get to work with my husband all day. Not that we don't anyway, but still. <laughs> <laughs> but now you get paid for it, right? <laughs> yeah. Now I get paid for it. Yeah. That'd be great. Now I get paid to yell at people too because I'll be HR. <laughs> <laughs> you are, I'm, I'm actually a little concerned about how excited you are about that. <laughs> 
My, like somebody really, at my job said that too the other day. <laughs> you are really, 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 really excited about that. I don't, I don't know how it makes you feel. <laughs> my boss said that the other day. We have a, um, we have a frequent caller list, and when people call too much, we tell them you have to call back next shift because there could be people in crisis. So, when one person calls, we let everybody know, hey, this person has already called. Don't let tell them call back next shift. And I'm like, oh, ooh, they called. I hope she calls me next because I love setting good boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> like, I thrive on the fact that I go, I can't talk to you. You have to call back next shift. Bye bye. <laughs> thrive on it. So, yeah, my boss <laughs> said the same thing to me the other day. <laughs> For, for those who uh, 99% who, who don't see the uh, video, while she's saying that, Daniel is putting his hand on his forehead and shaking <laughs> his head. <laughs> SMH. <laughs> at, least I left, at least I left the F out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wow. You guys are wild. <laughs> Yeah, but we keep things lively. That's the most important thing. Indeed. True story. Yeah. So, um, let's see. Where else can we go with uh, entrepreneurship? I, I feel like that's like the topic of the day here. Mm. Um, okay, so we've exp we've explored why you should consider it, why you perhaps shouldn't consider it. Um, okay, let's let's go with this. Let's go with just development. Um, you get an idea, you get an inspiration, something that that moves you. Like, yeah, I really want to pursue that. Um, and I'm kind of pointing toward a comment that you made earlier, Daniel, about getting help, but getting uh, expertise, mentorship, and so mm -hmm. forth. But you aren't really sure where to go. You aren't really sure what to do next. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. that's like a softball question, but what do you do next? Depends on what the problem is. Outsource. It's, it really. Depends on what the problem is. So, like, if you've got an accounting problem, then you need to go and look for resources for your jurisdiction that match accounting. Google's a good place to start. You can start, mm -hmm. you know, checking different companies that can offer sources. For those people who are on a budget, you've got things like uh, Upwork and Fiverr. That's with two R's dot com. You've got mm -hmm. a lot of competent professionals on there that are quite reasonably priced. Um, we did our tax filings with someone from Upwork last year because the accountant that we were using was ripping us off. And we went and did it on, did it on Upwork. Um, because it was last minute, we didn't have time to go and search. So when you go on Upwork, you can check the reviews. You can mm -hmm. actually speak to past cast clients of uh, the person and, and get things checked. But yeah, it's going to come down to doing some research and it's going to come down to you, you know, knowing where you're going to have to apply some smarts. And it may even be that you need to go and ask for some advice about where to ask for some advice from. So I get mm -hmm. people asking me all the time, you know, oh, I'm, you know, I've got this problem, you know, where's a good place for me to look for help? But when you know what the specific problem is, then you can di direct someone in the, the, the best direction for them. Point someone in the best the best direction for them. Yeah, right. That, that's an important piece. I just remember what it was like. Um, like I said earlier, I, I it took me a long time to learn the importance of asking for help when I didn't know mm -hmm. what to do. Um, but e even in those times where I, I even considered the idea of asking for help, I wasn't even sure what to ask for. All I knew was that I felt overwhelmed. I think that's mm -hmm. probably one of the first things that, that people run into. They they they, and, they and that's face the enormity down. of it all. And that's when you need to slow down. It might be that you need to take a, a breather to get into space. Remember, I spoke about being in a conducive space, mm -hmm. right? So it's okay. Right now, I'm not resourced to even ask the questions. Let me slow it down so I can get into a place where I can at least ask the bloody question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where the journaling and the meditation and all that come in really handy. Yeah, or even just going for a bloody walk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the, Changing the scenery, changing the physiology, um, changing the music that you're playing, stopping watching the depressing things that's making you more depressed and watch some comedy or something. Go and watch The Good Place. Laugh. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Why do you ask The Good Place? Yes! <laughs> yeah. 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 So I well, think that's see. a big part. Look, step Look, one, get into, a, get into a place where you can actually ask those questions and you can actually formulate what the questions are and then uh, go from there. It, it took us 29 minutes to get to a TV reference, but we got there. <laughs> <laughs> we, thought we, we thought we'd ease you back in. <laughs> I have to say, I have been a little bit disappointed with the caliber of new TV shows over the last year. Agreed. Not even going to lie. Not even going to lie. We've normally, we've and... norm, every, before every week, we had something excited to talk about. Now it's kind of like, yeah. Everything's either gone downhill or hasn't started off right. What what would you say has gone downhill? One thing you said has gone down. You would say gone downhill. Ooh, gone downhill. Hmm. 
Riverdale? I didn't even get into it. Don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> Don't bother. Mm -mm. Uh, Grey's Anatomy is a big one that's gone downhill. I was out of that when Isaiah Washington got kicked off. I was like, yeah, this was ridiculous. I'm out. I actually got better at once he got kicked off. <laughs> Did it? I wasn't, I wasn't a fan. <laughs> I liked him. He was good in his part. I did not like yeah. his character, and then I found out who he was behind the scenes, and I do not like him even more. Oh god, I didn't get. I'm getting to that politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they've had twenty years. They've had twenty years. Give cut them some slack. Yeah, it's time to let it go. Honestly. <laughs> well, that's part of the problem with any television series, isn't it? Knowing when to when to stop. I, I can tell you exactly what they should have stopped at season eleven. That's when they should have stopped. But now we're on nineteen. Well, they don't know how to. Do you know what I did? I ruined what? myself. What'd you do? I I had some downtime when I had to be up late. So I was I had like a couple of hours that I had to like find something to keep me occupied. When everyone uh -huh. was asleep in Dubai, but I had to be up late for things. And I went back and I watched the last season and a half of Vampire Diaries and remembered why I stopped halfway through the season that I stopped in. Uh, I did the same thing. I did the exact same thing. I was, I was like, like Hmm, I haven't seen it in a while. Let me go back. And then I no. watched like two, three episodes and I'm like, why did I start? How did I get hooked? I, 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 I finished it because I had to, because of my compulsive yeah. nature. But yeah. for anyone that, that realized that the season season seven narrative was ridiculous and, and thought that they should stop, just stop. Yep. Yep. Leave it. Check in after season five. Always check in after season five. If you haven't watched it at all, don't bother. Just leave it. And even originals after that was like two seasons were good and then trash. I think I watched the first one or whatever and then the thing where he got you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was like, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> it didn't. And then they did a third spinoff and I was like, I had to watch this, it but I didn't want to watch this it. Is, this, this is my city. No, this is my city. <laughs> This is my family. I've been here for generations. This is my city. No, this is my city, Klaus Michelson. Like, <laughs> yep. <laughs> Anyone got some white oak? Some white oak? Right. Anybody? Let's just end it now. <laughs> my head. Right. My head. <laughs> Fans will get the reference. Yeah, but I'm the same way. I'm compulsive. I have to finish it. Yeah, I, I had to. And I get a little bit broken hearted at these people that emotionally wrote me in because I'm not going to understand something else I am going to enjoy unless I watch this thing that I won't, a.k.a. she, uh, Poo Hulk. Um, I'm like, <laughs> I have First to watch all, this. I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> you loved it? I loved it. Every minute of it. Loved it. You loved it? <laughs> <laughs> Like Everyone says, says it. yes, like yes, guilty pleasure loved it. Want to see a second season? I <laughs> get out, get out of town. I swear, I swear, I feel like I'm the only one, but you yeah, are. I loved it. <laughs> God. But then they make amazing shows like Floki, amazing show, hands down. Um, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, amazing, yep. Wanda show. Vision, Wanda Vision, amazing show, <laughs> Moon Knight. Ooh. What happened? What? You didn't like Moon Knight? Bruh. You liked it? I loved it. <laughs> I liked the acting. I liked yep. the the actors. Yep. I know that they had to give us that to give us particular points of plot. Right. But I'm like, do we need another character in the MCU? <laughs> like, Can we do without this MCU character? <laughs> I don't know the history, but I don't see where he fits in. I don't see them calling him to be an Avenger. I don't see it, but what do I know? Like, anyway. But they make some good ones. They make some good ones. <laughs> yeah. How did you feel about Hawkeye? Did you watch it? Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Listeners, you, you got to see the look on Dan's face. I, I wish I could describe <laughs> it, but it, it, it just kind of imagine biting into something you really don't like. That's the look. No, you know that face you make when you have really bad gas? 
Okay, that's a good one. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to describe it. Yeah. <laughs> but I know with her and with with that one and Miss Marvels because they're introducing the Junior Avengers, and that's why yeah. they had to bring Riri Re- 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 into. Yep. What kind of forever? So, oh, mm-hmm. oh, look at me! I just magically have an Iron Man suit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder where that one's going. I've just been in Boston together. building it for years and years and nobody oh, noticed. <laughs> nobody noticed that I had an Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just zooming across the Cambridge Bridge, like whatever. It's just, nobody noticed. <laughs> nobody noticed that I had firepower. Where did I get my gun? Like, come on. <laughs> I admit, there are some plot holes. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> the plot, not even one kind of forever. Plot holes forever is what I would... Oh, <laughs> I haven't seen Alex lose it like this in a long time. I'm glad came back to the oh, my cheeks are hurting. <laughs> well, I don't know. Oh man! You, I don't know. you guys know that that I'm not much of a TV watcher. There is actually a series I've been watching. I, I'm Get just going to be shocking to you. What is it? Tell us! Down. Tell us now! <laughs> it's the Ted Lasso series. I, I thought you oh, I, I've okay. enjoyed it, and, and, and they're just I, I'm glad that they just launched uh, season three. So I'm looking forward to seeing that first episode. I haven't seen it yet. Whoa, 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 whoa! Walt is looking forward to watching a show. I know it's scary, isn't it? More than one season? Yeah. Well, well, that leads up to my point. My my point is this: the the people involved in Ted Lasso have made it very clear season three is the last three last season. They're not going beyond season three. Yeah, Apple doesn't really do that. Yeah. Well, no, it was yeah, it was the Apple, people Apple's involved in the show who decided that. Yeah, yeah no, but Apple's, Apple's they've got like hundreds of billions of cash reserves. They they can make another show. They could, yeah. <laughs> they could go make something different. Some of these guys are like, well, we don't want to develop something else, so let's keep this one going. And some but, of them but, are like, let's like, reboot the old stuff. Yeah, it's like um, the, um, they now they're going to do another Game of Thrones spinoff. Yep. About Jon Snow. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, you mean there are some people who are still alive in that show? No. We don't want to give away any plot holes. <laughs> okay. Listen, if you haven't seen it by now, and I'm not even a Game of Thrones fan, and I know what's going on, so it's like, get it together. Well, do you know what? The, 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 one, the prequel show they've made, I think is kind of hard. I didn't, I didn't watch it. It's very hard. Um, mm-hmm. it didn't need black people. Didn't need black people. I saw they did with the with the the white Not dread wigs. And... Not, yeah. forever. <laughs> Not quite sure where that came from. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't want the woke people to cancel us, but it fits or it doesn't. Everything. <laughs> Not everything requires that degree of self-destructive affirmative action. Mm, period. He uh, said what he uh, said. What <laughs> he may dislike me, but Idris Elba won't be a good James Bond either. Okay, moving on swiftly. <laughs> but it's a very good show. <laughs> yeah, just, just I'm going to have to agree. I'm going to have to agree. I, I, I just think that we people of color have more pressing issues than being a part of Game of Thrones and being representative as a misogynist murderer that is James Bond. There mm-hmm. are other things we can take care of. We have Sorry, pieces of history that we could, you know, put on display yeah. go, that go hasn't and been seen the, before. Go and, do, go and do a show about the King of Mali, who was the richest man in all of history. Go and do a show about the Moors. Go and do something interesting. Mm-hmm. Let's do a show about do a show about the, um, there's, a, um, what's the guy's name? Robert something or other. He's the richest black guy in America, a hedge fund owner. Go and do something about his life story. Go mm-hmm. do go, there's, do you know how much rich African and even African American literature there is where we can have superheroes. Go and yes. Do that. Yes. And stop trying to put white hair wigs. Yes. On black people for the sake of affirmative action. That's my period. That's my said what I said. Anyway, moving swiftly on from something that will get us cancelled. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it is it is good. The, the the story the story's hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, the texture, the tension is hard. Mm-hmm. Twists happen, like you engage with the characters. There's, uh, it's grit. It's what Game of Thrones mm. should have been. That level of grit. Do you know season one of? Did you watch any Game of Thrones? 
I watched parts of season one and then I watched the last season. Okay, season, yeah, you, you've seen all you need to see, to be honest. Um, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> It was like once brothers and sisters started banging each other, I was like, I gotta go. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah. Not yeah. for me. <laughs> yeah. But um, like uh, season one was true to text. Parts of season two were true to text because the books are epic. The books are oh, really, yeah, I've really, heard. really, really good. The poor yeah. man is so busy, rich in Hollywood that he's not finished the books. Mm, that's what I've heard. <laughs> George. George, stop eating Cheetos and finish the book, okay? Um, but the the, the book, the, this, this show is really, really, it's it's, it's strong. It's it's strong. Yeah. It's, it, it's got the spirit of the books. Okay, good. Without the incest. Uh, I, got, <laughs> I got a question for the for the two TV knots here. Because uh, yeah. you guys just, you, you guys are like on top of stuff that I have never even heard of half the time. Uh, but one of the things that I've always been kind of a little frustrated about where, um, TV series are concerned, particularly series based on books, so Game of Thrones being an example of one, mm -hmm. is they they seem to treat them the same way that a movie will treat a book, because understandably, a movie can only squeeze so much of a book into a two-hour period. Right. But with a series, you can keep going with episodes. It's not like you're you're restricted. The only thing yeah, that's restricting like, you is your, is your desire to restrict. Sometimes there's too much material. So yeah. the, the depth the depth of character because you've got to remember like the last book book five of the series which is the lot of seven which is the last one he's written it's, it's like 800 pages long or 900 pages long mm -hmm. it's not a little book and there, there mm -hmm. are plots that go off and there's all of these strands and because he hasn't finished writing the books they don't know where those characters are going so right. they had to cut certain characters out cut certain um people spent short so for example like um the whole thing of when Sansa gets married off the second time against her mm -hmm. will, for those I don't want to talk a bit too much on it. That doesn't happen in the books. It's something else they do in the books. There's another character um, that's in the story that that happens with, mm -hmm. and it's to do with Arya, not even to do with Sansa. Oh, but because, but because, but because they didn't know where those threads were going, they were like, "Well, let's just bring that one over here and do that with that." And like yeah. Mance Raider's still alive at the point in the books now, um, which goes well beyond when he, you know, he doesn't quite make it beyond the fire and arrows. He's still alive and he actually teams up and like, there's a whole little merry band of warriors with Mance Raider and a couple mm -hmm. of other guys that are actually involved in retaking Winterfell. So, yeah, there's um, there's much more depth of character that they don't always have the capacity to translate into film. that Because remember, most of us that watch TV aren't all that clever. So when there's right. too many threads people can't keep it gets up. complicated think, and people fall off which is why amazing shows like the wire which i think is one of the best written tv shows mm. of all time apart from apart from the very last episode sorry dominic west stick to acting <laughs> um <laughs> but that last scene wasn't that cheesiest yeah like he's looking at the bridge like, oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> but because but because it's such a rich show people couldn't couldn't really follow it like they yeah. write amazing TV, but people can't follow the threads, and so people don't. Even and it's getting even worse with 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 the the TikTok generation. People are used to sixty no seconds of entertainment. Yeah, yeah, the instant gratification. They're not going to sit there for an hour with no commercials or, and try to figure or, out what's going or, on. Or to sit there for a few seasons <laughs> to let a character actually develop, so you can have to right, to it. right. Well, that leads to a question in my mind, and that is if these people are going to have so much of a struggle keeping up with multiple threads in a television series. How are they going to handle multiple threads when reading a book? Because they don't read books. That's why they watch TV. So essentially television should be written for people who don't read. That's, that's no, the conclusion people, I'm drawing no, from what you're saying. People should read and leave good people TV for those of us. Our yeah. TV quality shouldn't be reduced because you guys can't read. Right. So that goes back to my question again. Like I, you, you mentioned uh, not knowing where a character development is going to go. I, I, I don't know all yeah. the TV series, but I can point to a series I do know. I know the Harry Potter movie series. And when they were right. making the movies, they didn't know what was happening with a lot of those character lines. They, yeah, but, and the actors that actually but, talked about how they, they, like, they wanted like, okay, so how do they iron this guy out? They had no idea. And yet they managed yeah, but to they, still. But J.K. They, Rowling was with it and she at least knew what she was doing. I think, I mean, George has been writing books since. Book five came out in 2005. 
I it is now 2023. Is it 2005 Book 5 came out? Something like that? 2000? It's 2000 and something. It was, pre, it was pre-2010. Was it <laughs> That's what I know. Like, regardless if someone's going to fact check me, it's pre-2010. Because I read it in 2012 and it had been out mm. for a little bit. Okay. And since then he hasn't finished book six and he's still working things out. So I don't yeah. think that he even knows where everything's going. But I guess my, my point is, why why yet. is that so important? Because they, like I said, with the Harry Potter series, they were still able to make a, a really good series, even though they didn't know yeah, where but, things were going. But, but, but J.K. Rowling probably knew where things were going to end up. And so mm-hmm. when they were developing, could lead them in the right direction as, right. as, as writers, as an arc. I, Actually, I, I from, from what I understand, she gave she gave very little clue about that kind of thing. In fact, there's a rather famous story within the Harry Potter film circle about <laughs> how Alan Rickman, who played Snape, once didn't know cornered, he didn't once, know. He once cornered her about whether or not he should play the character in a certain way, and got a piece of information that the director didn't even have. Ooh. Uh, so she was she was giving it out with a thimble. I mean, just well, but, it looks like but, an but, eyedropper. But, you can, but the thing is, you can watch one Harry Potter film and not be completely disassociated from the entire thread. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't you wouldn't be as well versed, but you could watch the last two films and have quite a pleasant movie experience. That's Whereas true. You couldn't watch you couldn't watch um, season four, for example, of Game of Thrones, and not be lost. Right. Like you, you you you'd be lost. Well, I think that's the difference between a TV series and a movie is like they hold their own as opposed to a TV series needs the others to bring it along. But there are some TV series that you can watch in isolation with a little bit of catch up. Yeah. There are, there are, there's, uh, enough, there's, enough of, there's, an, there's enough of an arc. So yeah. a TV show that I love that I'm actually watching again is The Expanse. Mm-hmm. And it's based on, it's based on books. And because the books are so well written, in my opinion, and the stories are so neat, even though there's this ongoing arc across all six seasons and there's character development across all six seasons, mm-hmm. there's enough meat on the bones for you to have a pleasant experience watching, dropping in and watching any of those seasons and having a complete arc that actually gives you some resolution. Mm-hmm. Some resolution at the end of each one. Um, I think there's a degree of resolution with the Harry Potter films. So you've mm-hmm. got uh, Overcoming the Monster, uh, which happens two or three of them. Then you've got um, the redemption story with the prisoner of Azkaban with, um, you know, what happens with that one. Um, mm-hmm. With the Half-Blood Prince, you've got the revelation adventure that you go on with yep. him with that. And then when you've got the Deathly Hollows, you've got the whole adventure of finding the Horcruxes or whatever they're called. Yep. Mm-hmm. And there's that adventure that you get to be a part of. And then you get the whole closing off of the whole arc. But there's enough in each one. There's an adventure going on rather than just one sequential Right. Because with, like, with Game of Thrones, there's no real resolution at the end of any season. It kind of no. just builds and builds and builds and builds and builds there's no real resolution see see that for me points to it isn't about whether or not the audience can follow multiple threads it's about whether the author can write something that holds within an episode oh but those are two different conversations in my opinion yeah um, i don't think so i think they're actually part of the same conversation because the con- the, the point of the conversation is why don't we put more of the detail from the books into the tv series that's that's because the often, ultimate question often, that I was raising. Often, often there is there's too much to put in. Like I said, with and I use oh. the Game of Thrones one specifically because there are so many characters. So for example, in game in the book of Game of Thrones, um, there's a uh, uh, there are multiple multiple sons of Robert Baratheon in the books. Mm-hmm. Whereas in in the TV show, they just give us Gendry and they merge all of those other ones stories into Gendry's. Otherwise, mm-hmm. you've got these multiple threads of his bastard son, his illegitimate children. Pardon me. <laughs> um, you wouldn't be able to keep track. That you, we, we not even be able to keep track. It's not really that necessary for the story that they were choosing to select from yeah. the threads. But that's the point. They're they're being selective, and they and to me, what 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 that the, the the problem that in my mind that creates is that we're getting away from what the point or not the point, the points of the original story were all about, because those points are what drew people into the, to be readers in the first place. I oh, think even the Harry people. Potter series makes the same mistake. I mean, they, they do well, it. I, I understand think. why they do it, but if, I, I still think it's a mistake. Like in the Deathly Hallows, the, the two movies, they, there, there was like a, a whole arc, talk about an arc, there was a whole arc of the relationship between Ron and Hermione that basically not only got rewritten, but it got shrunk down to this little tiny piece and it mm. was a huge part of the book, The Deathly Hollows. 
it was a major part of the story and it just kind of got yeah. cut out while well, i'm thinking well i understand why they, they had budgetary limits and so forth but wouldn't it be cool if you turn that like into a tv series and you actually play out the deathly hollows over say out, four or five it. episodes mm -hmm. well i think they're doing that with some things they did that with um the golden compass they tried to make it into one film god knows how many years ago it didn't really squeeze into one film so then they made it into a show so that they can have the time to build it yeah over exactly the exactly and then um with 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 and i think that because and i think it's it's challenging with the going back to the, the 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 song of ice and fire series of books it's because there has not been anywhere near enough resolution in the main characters they kind of had to look at the source material and say well, which story are we going to focus on and i think this is one of the ways it gets a little bit messy because it should have been because it's the song of ice and fire we know it should have been john snow's story but mm -hmm. it actually ends up being primarily daenerys's story right and so then when they have to resolute that, resolve that, and it ends up being a really messy resolution because that wasn't actually, a lot of the material wasn't building up to that story. It was building up to this story. But we, we don't know yet how the story was supposed to end because it, it hasn't finished yet. But right. I'm quite confident it wasn't supposed to be who it was that ends up with the, um, the thing that he ends up with. And now because that story, now because that story was so incomplete, now they're having to go and do another TV show Yep. to actually give us the rest of that character that mm -hmm. we didn't get the chance to have. There's also right. a technical side to it, whereas when you when you start a show, you don't know if it's going to go past the first season until it gets to the end of the first season. You don't know if you're going to be renewed. So sometimes you got to try to squeeze the main story into that 10 episodes that's going to catch everybody and make sure that they want a season two for you to continue mm. to tell your story. So mm. there's that part of it too. It's an important point because ultimately I think that's how you end up with the problem that Daniel was postulating earlier, that people just mm -hmm. are, don't have the, the capacity. I don't think it's capacity. I think it's uh, just attention span. They, they mm -hmm. don't have the attention span to pay attention to all the threads. Well, that's because that's the, the LCD that you're, you're, you're aiming at by trying to you're, – you're trying to make this series catch on for like eight episodes so you can get renewed. Well, yeah. yeah, the only way that you're ever going to do that is by aiming at the lowest common denominator. So you're always going to get a lowest common denominator show that way. But do you know Not something? I, but do you know one thing I find to be really funny? Mm. That when a show gets to be, oh, this is going to be the last season, it gets good. Like Picard. <laughs> right? I'm watching season three. I'm like, so now you guys know how to write a TV show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're like, this oh, is so the end of the budget. Spend it all now. <laughs> Oh, we'll get a quality writer that, that knows how to actually write a Star Trek series. Yeah. But, um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> he digresses. I, I, well, that's what this last 20 minutes has been, one great big digression. But we love this kind of digression. <laughs> this is the kind we used to do all the time, right? Oh, it's right. Yeah. So no, this is – well, and, and to, let's be fair. That's really what the other big advantage is to this kind of, uh, of formulaic – approach that is used these days to put a series together it gives critics the opportunity to criticize it gives yeah. people the opportunity to complain on social media oh, I, I can't believe they took that off on a different track mm -hmm. what better way That's to get buzz, right? thing. go with your own opinion don't listen to the critics they know nothing yeah i, I was told ant-man was rubbish and i really enjoyed it i haven't seen it yet but i heard amazing things but everyone in the marvel community was complaining i don't know why same thing with a lot of stuff. A lot of people were disappointed with stuff. And I was just like, bro, like, what do you mean? Yeah. And when I want to know about a movie, I, I look at uh, something like Rotten Tomatoes. I skip all of the critics' interview, or reviews. Or the I look audience at, view. I look at the audience views, and I give that maybe 50% credence. And then I go actually look yeah. at the synopsis and maybe the mm -hmm, trailer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I, I just skip the critics. The critics are wrong much more often than they're right. Yeah. Yeah. Most of them are paid by someone or other. Mm-hmm. And says, I, I, I have one, I have noticed too, that this also ties into what we talked about just a moment ago. The critics are all about how well does a film hit that lowest common denominator? That's what all the reviews are about. So they're all about mm -hmm. how much action there was there, you know, how much development, how much, how much violence, how much is like, whoa, what about the story? The mm -hmm. critics seem to have forgotten that part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway. I actually Probably. got to say something in the middle of a TV conversation. Who knew? <laughs> I've got to say, I was a little thrown off by it. <laughs> Me too. Multiple seasons. I was like, "What?" <laughs> but I would, I would, I would check out the Expanse. 
well, it's a, it's very it's a very interesting show. What do you like about it? The thing I love about it is it's a very gritty, down to earth science fiction show mm-hmm. with multiple depths, great character development, um, interesting threads, very interesting topics about social um, social justice, social order, and class systems. Um, it's an interesting show, and it's based on a very good book as well. Okay, so another book based one, The Expanse, mm-hmm. you said. The Expanse is on Amazon Prime. All right. Hey, Speaking of Amazon the, Prime, when are the boys coming time. back? What's that? I said, speaking of Amazon Prime, when are the boys coming back? I don't know where they're going to go next. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> it's like, I think they kind of put it all on the line. I don't know. They if, really, I, know if, I mean, I after the I octopus. Don't I, <laughs> I don't, I, I tried to forget about that. But I really <laughs> feel that they put it all on the line. <laughs> now. Like, where can you go from here? <laughs> <laughs> right, we but I think that's the story. point of the show. Damn you, Kripke, you got me again. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We'll see. What this one one thing this conversation does for me is what it usually does when when we have this conversation. It reminds me why it is I don't watch much television. No, let me tell you, this is not the show for you, Walt. This is not I can for tell. You. This is not for you, but the expanse. I think you would enjoy. Um, I think you would enjoy. So the basic premise is that um, we're about two, three hundred years into the future. Uh, we've colonized the solar system, but it's mm. not it's not lasers and laser beams. It's like mechanical, and like they've developed a new engine system and they're little uh-huh. um, they're little like dome based. So there's real issues like air filters, and they have to go and farm ice from Saturn. And there's a ship that has to bring it mm. to to this place over here and what's going on with the politics of there and Mars has been calling up. It's really interesting. So they've really given a lot of thought to the political economy yeah. of this thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because you've got what you've got, you've got um, Earth and the moon, a one nation. Mm-hmm. Then you've got Mars, which was originally an Earth station, but they fought for their independence. And so there's this Cold War going on with them. And mm-hmm. then you've got the, the, the working class are all the people who've been working on the asteroids and on all these space stations that are mining resources to send back to Earth and Mars and how basically they look down on and they're trodden down on and they're trying to fight for their uh, independence. And stuff. It's very, very interesting. Mm. And then you've got other political actors in there creating things. But yeah, there's none of that. There's no, like, the stealth ships don't have invisibility folk. They've got, like, stealth technology like you have with a plane, like stealth yeah. technology. I mean, so it's, it's, and it's not lasers, it's bullets. So, oh, we've run out of bullets. Like, yeah, we've run out of bullets. You know, so it happens. It, it, I like it's how real, it's more realistic than it's very futuristic. Realistic. Yeah, there's no teleportation. There's an actual tube that comes, and they need spacesuits, and it runs out of air. It's not magically got some laser field with ray guns. <laughs> so you see people in real danger and real going yeah. through real things. It's, um, yeah, you're, you're reminding me of a of a novel, relatively obscure novel. I have to acknowledge, but a novel I kind of wish had been turned into a movie at one point uh, because. And this is going to sound weird coming from me. It's actually talking about war. But uh, one of the uh, themes of the book is uh, it's, it's a story about the moon and Earth. And the moon is basically a prison colony that turned into a regular colony that is now in the process like of revolting. Kind of like Australia. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's now revolting, trying to become its own unique entity. And, and the powers of be on Earth are, are resisting that. And when they go to war, the... Uh, the, the the colony on the moon takes advantage of the gravity field as a way of creating a weapon. Basically, they throw rocks at the Earth and they guide them with uh, with guidance missiles. And and they they can actually you know, use a catapult to put a rock out into space and eventually gets to Earth's orbit and then they can guide into where they want it to land and and uh, basically be a bomb. I mean, I mean that that's kind of like what you guys are talking about. This is like real stuff that you do. I'm I'm not recommending that we go to war from from the moon, but you know. <laughs> but it was clever. I, do, I, do, I like I, that. I do have to run though, guys, because it's I've got to go and do the next the next um, the next thing in Yeah, we got to run too. I I think I just yeah. wanted to stress this out because I was enjoying it so much. But uh, well, <laughs> we got to get you back again, Dan. Yeah, I'll, I'll tap you in. I I don't know where I'm going to be for the next couple of months, but as soon as I've got some clarity with bookings and stuff, I will. Well, I'll keep I, us posted. Absolutely. I think we we've kind of gotten used to Dan gets to show up every you know six eight months something like that. So you know, <laughs> <laughs> he gets here when he gets here. 
<laughs> all right. Thank, thank you guys very much. Thank you, podcast listeners everywhere. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Woo!